أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more from this your show from the holy city of Karbala, back to the basics. You are joining me, your host, Yahya Seymour, in which we continue. And inshallah ta'ala, tonight is the final episode in which we shall summarize and round off our engagement with the worldview, which entitles itself, or has respectively been entitled by the rest of the world as atheism. Now, of course, I will define atheism by its classical meaning which has been embraced by numerous atheists themselves to mean they lack and the absence of a God, as opposed to merely lacking a belief in a God. So what I mean by that is I'm not discussing agnosticism tonight. I'm not discussing any other worldview tonight. I'm discussing the atheistic worldview, which teaches that the universe has no creator, no sustainer, and takes pride in the fact that it renounces this belief. Now, of course, that is not to say that you do have some atheists who will say, well, look, that's not my belief. I believe that there's not enough evidence to suggest that there is a God. At the end of the day, such a person who wants to go down such a route needs to also be held accountable for their beliefs too. And what I mean by that is we have seen quite prolifically over the past few sessions that when you deny the existence of God, when you deny the existence of Allah Azawajal, when you strip this universe of agency, purpose, and of course a divine hand which has guided the process, there are certain nasty consequences. Now, of course, if it were just nasty consequences as in the likes of, oh no, there's no heaven anymore, well, whilst that is still equally as tragic for many of us, these are not the consequences we're talking about. We're talking about consequences on a much heavier penetrating scale, which essentially render the lives that we all live on a day-to-day -day basis as useless, purposeless, and based upon an imaginary set of rules that we have created for ourselves whilst living in a giant matrix-like scenario quite seriously and quite frankly, what we have seen from our engagement with quite critical and honest and even, dare I say, quite daring atheist thinkers is for them to embrace the reality of the fact that really the consequences of their beliefs are quite simply that we have been deceived in many, many different areas. Now, of course, since tonight is our last discussion on atheism, I would like very much to round off where we have reached and in order to help the viewer remind themselves and refresh their memories about what we have come to understand about the atheist mindset, especially those consistent atheists. I'll remind my viewers that we embrace the principles of the Imams from the Ahlul Bayt. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all who state that when discussing with anyone, compel them by the very principles to which they compel themselves. So if someone takes a foundational principle, a foundational presupposition, or they take a particular belief, those beliefs will naturally have consequences. Now, it's not sufficient for you to not be willing to embrace the consequences of your beliefs. And we've seen that by far the more consistent atheists have been willing to go all the way down the rabbit hole. They've been willing to embrace Alice in Wonderland herself. And they've been willing to embrace, I'm not sure if it's the red pill or the blue pill really, in this delusional-like matrix that they found themselves in. And of course, it is not our intention to be offensive to anyone. We hope that if what I am saying is false, then there can be a reasonable dialogue. And a reasonable dialogue, of course, is one far away from mocking, far away from this kind of 
high school rhetoric which we commonly see from such discussions and more importantly one which embraces the principles of dialogue and what I mean by the principles of dialogue is let's discuss the thoughts let's not discuss them in such a crude manner that all we're doing is offending one another I, I mean one thing that we've certainly observed from many of these debates be it between theists and atheists or even theists amongst themselves in different religions and what have you is that often there's a lot of people that possess very sharp tongues but don't necessarily possess very sharp minds and it's necessary for us to keep things academic let's keep things reasonable we're not here to hate one another we're not here to ridicule one another rather we all want truth and it is sincerely my prayer by the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him that Allah azawajal through the right of the shaheed of the martyr of this holy city would open up the eyes of those who have so heavily deceived themselves and indeed if I am one of those who has deceived myself then I pray that my eyes are likewise opened of course in order to open people's eyes we need to do this in a very respectful manner no one's going to take you seriously if all you're going to do is offend every sentiment they have now there's a big difference between being frank and being offensive so what we have been doing on this show inshallah ta'ala or what I have been doing on this show rather and may Allah forgive me for using the royal we if it's been in any arrogant way shape or form is I have attempted to discuss these issues frankly and I pray heavily that my viewers have not found anything I have said to be offensive and please forgive me if you have found anything I've said to be offensive for indeed such an approach is one that returns to me and is not necessarily one that returns to this channel and indeed I'm responsible for any mistakes which have been committed on this television broadcast with the exception of the technical errors in which case they're often not my fault but nonetheless dear viewers we return back to the topic inshallah ta'ala what we have observed dear viewers from the very start of this discussion is that when we come back to the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, they have clearly stated that one who knows himself knows his Lord. And that the one who knows most about himself knows his Lord. In fact, we have seen that there is a plethora of traditions in this light which can be found in our books of narration. Allow me to quote them very quickly, inshallah ta'ala. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam is cited as saying, a clever person is someone who knows his self and does things with sincerity. Knowledge of the self is the more beneficial of the two forms of knowledge. A knower, arif, is someone who knows his self and releases it and repels it from anything that would farther it away from Allah azawaja. The greatest of ignorance is a person's ignorance of himself. The greatest of wisdom is a person's knowledge of his self. People who have the most knowledge of their selves have more fear of their Lord. The best of the intellect is a person's knowledge of his own self. So whoever knows his self will be no more knowledgeable and he who is ignorant of his self will fall astray. It surprises me that someone who has lost something searches for it whilst when he has lost his self he does not look for it it surprises me that a person is ignorant of his self how can he know his Lord the goal of knowledge is for a person to know his self how can one who does not know others know his self it is sufficient in knowledge for a person to know his self it is sufficient in ignorance for a person to have ignorance of his self he who knows his self will struggle with it he who is ignorant of his self will neglect it. He who knows his self knows his Lord. And inshallah ta'ala this shall suffice from the quotations about knowledge of the self. Of course, dear viewers, one thing we need to understand when looking at such a tradition 
is we need to read it in light of the other traditions of the Imams. We need to read it in light of the totality of material that we have from the Imams. So one thing we know from the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, is according to that which they've taught in the worldview of Islam, we believe that Allah Azza wa Jal has, of course, made us aware of Himself and He is the primary one who has caused us to be aware of Him. It is not that we as human beings gained this awareness of Him through being aware of ourselves, no. The Rawayat of the Ahlul Bayt and particularly the supplications of the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, state that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who came and gave us this knowledge of Himself by Himself. And this is of course the more primary level of knowledge and the ma'rafah that we have of Allah through a ma'rafah of ourselves is a more basic kind of, more general kind of knowledge. But dear viewers, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go for a very quick break and I shall explain more when we return. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. viewers thank you so much for joining us after that very short break of course before the break we were discussing the importance of a tradition about someone who knows themselves being in more of a position to of course know their Lord and I explained that this is a more general type of ma'rafa whereas the ma'rafa that we have which leads us to Allah Azza wa Jal is a more specific type of ma'rafa and that is a ma'rafa which is what we call the ma'rafa fitriya the ma'rafa given to us within the innate disposition of a human being now, of course, this is extremely interesting. One thing we find when it comes to this concept of the fitra, and for those of you that are more interested, you may refer to the previous episodes of this series in which we have tried our best to ex explicate and demonstrate that there is what we could call contextual evidences which assist us in our understanding of the fitra and demonstrate that it is an objective understanding. It is not merely something which is subject to this level of confirmation bias where I can say that atheists deep down believe in God and they can tell me that I deep down don't believe in God. Of course it's not really that subjective. I have of course to the best of my ability cited objective evidence demonstrating that we as human beings have a faculty which resonates and bears heavy similarities to the concept invoked in Islam known as the fitra. And of course we mentioned that a great making property of a worldview is that it would have good explanatory scope for the phenomenon that we see around us. And so Islam certainly has great explanatory scope for the doctrine or the belief that human beings have this innate belief in God. Now of course how have the atheists dealt with this innate belief in God? They've gone down the route, many of them, to suggest that this is a hoax or an illusion or a delusion placed upon us as a survival mechanism by our Darwinian devices and our essential attempts as a species to survive. So there are many who actually claim that religion is merely an evolutionary byproduct that in order to allow human beings to survive further they have been endowed with this false belief that there is divine agency. Now of course one of the major problems with this acknowledgement is that if evolution in order to make us survive has concerned itself with injecting within human species false beliefs for the purpose of survival, how would we trust any of our regular beliefs? How would we know that every single thing we believe, every single thing we observe is not merely a delusion which is cast upon us by our evolutionary hope to advance as a species? Now of course 
there are some atheists who are quite willing to go down this route. You have Alex Rosenberg in his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality. Now, many people who are viewing this might just think that he's, he's a particular favorite of mine because he says everything I want him to say. Well, that might be true. Nonetheless, he has given very good cogent reasoning for why he believes in these things. And he's, he's certainly by no, by no means an imbecile. He's no, by no means an imbecile from an academic perspective. And what I mean by that is he's a very educated man. I'm sure his IQ is probably off the scales. And he's very educated in the field he happens to be writing in. If one observes his arguments, which I have gone through throughout the series, you would see that he makes a pretty sound and cogent case that if you were to simply believe in a materialistic physical universe, there would be no such thing as a thought. A thought which, of course, is an immaterial concept, and how can immaterial concepts exist in a purely physical universe? Now, if this is the case, that immaterial concepts can't exist, then you would have to summarize a thought in a physical light. And in order to do that, you would have to go down the route that Alex Rosenberg has, that it's merely an illusion. There is no such thing as thought. And in doing so, you invalidate the human thought process. Now, of course, what are the other consequences that we see in Alex Rosenberg's world? We see another consequence is really the lack of free will. Now, those are two what we would say is, from the perspective of we who live on a daily basis in this world, can you imagine changing your perception of the world to now believe that, number one, no one has a thought process, so no one chooses to do anything they do. And number two, no one, so no one actually thinks about what they believe because there's no such thing as thought. And number two, everyone's just chemically determined to do what they do. Imagine next time you see something on the streets that really angers you and aggravates you. What's it going to feel like if you believe that that person is stripped of agency altogether? That that person is just a victim of cosmic material destiny? Where one physical event preceded the event which he now lives in, and he had absolutely zero choice in the matter. Now, of course, I have mentioned that there have been certain papers written for judges in the United States of America to show a lot more leniency with criminals as a result of this line of reasoning. Of course, the big problem with this is if the criminal, if the criminal has no choice in his crime, what's the point of writing a letter for the judge who likewise has no choice in their judgment. And we see that this is one area where the worldview of Alex Rosenberg is unlivable. It's unlivable. Especially when we go down the next route, which is that even if we are to suggest that everyone is a victim of determinism, determinism being, of course, that one action or one event would proceed and lead to another without that person having a choice. Some people might believe in determinism, but yet nonetheless believe in an objective good and bad. Now, of course, Alex Rosenberg will have none of that. And he's not the only one. He is joined by a plethora of very intelligent atheists who acknowledge that if there is no God, there is no such thing as good or bad. Now, I want you all to consider this very, very wisely. Whenever we discuss with an atheist, what are their main objections to religion? Number one, they'll talk about how religion causes harm, suffering, and evil. Matter in motion doesn't have a right to not go through suffering. If everything is just determined by a previous physical event, why do they complain about religion? Number two, if there's no such thing as good or bad or evil or non-evil, that is to say evil and good, why even complain about them? Number three, 
If we cannot even think and there's no way to trust our minds, then why even believe in the argumentations that you have against theism? If your objections against religion are all premised upon intellectual doubts or moral doubts, and yet you belong to a worldview which undermines both the intellect and morality, then really what we are looking at is something quite confusing and dare I say, not worthy of taking one step further within the conversation. And what I mean by that is, it is akin to the judge who asks for evidence for the innocence of every person brought forward before him. And yet the judge has no way of knowing anything to be true. If the judge believes that there is no such thing as a canon of evidence that could ever convince him, and yet asks for proof for the innocence of the criminal brought before him, what would this lead to? Likewise, those who can know nothing are in no position to demand evidence for the existence of God until they can firstly establish for themselves anything else to a decent and adequate level of certainty. I know that this might sound confusing. It's very confusing at first. What I am saying is, when we look at the atheist worldview, no such thing as thought. That's according to Alex Rosenberg's world, where everything's physical, and the thought process, which is a non-physical process, this concept of having a thought about something else, is not physical. You have the anti-Darwinian accounts of knowledge as well, where you have Darwin himself and Patricia Churchland, who we've quoted in previous episodes, acknowledging if we have evolved from these relatives of ours, from the same species as these relatives of ours, these relatives such as chimpanzees who we believe are our cousins, then essentially since we don't trust their minds to come up with scientific or mathematical truths, why would we trust our own? After all, evolution is merely concerned with survival, the four Fs, fighting, fleeing, food and re reproduction. If this is the case, then we can't trust anything. And until, and until the atheists can give a decent account for knowledge, then we find that it's impossible to dialogue with them. Dear viewers, don't be arrogant at the difference between us and those who have accepted atheism. Many atheists aren't aware of these consequences. Many of them are far more intelligent than ourselves. But it goes to show that man in his arrogance can adopt absurd positions because of this concept of self-deceit. And we ask Allah Azza wa to provide all of us with guidance, I pray, that Allah Azza wa keeps us all upon the straight path and indeed guides us all to the straight path. Dear viewers, please forgive me if I've said anything offensive. And inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we shall be continuing with our series, but moving on to a different topic. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.